welcome to this roundtable discussion presented by the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies and the School of Literature, Languages and Linguistics. I'm uh, Dr. Elizabeth Meyer, the director of UNCLAS, and I'd like to acknowledge first the traditional custodians, elders past and present, on whose land we meet today and whose cultures and languages are among the oldest on this planet. So ANU is a national and regional source resource for languages because of both the breadth and the depth of languages we teach. In total, 27 languages, more than any other university in Australia, including European languages, Arabic, Asian, Australian and Pacific languages, both classic and modern, and some of which are never taught anywhere else, like Persian, Burmese, Portuguese, and most importantly for today's topic is Gamilaroi, an Australian Aboriginal language. ANCLA's vision is to become the focal point for research, education and outreach programs for Latin America in Australia and within the Asia-Pacific region. It aims to contribute to the expansion and deepening of the Australian Latin American and Asia-Pacific relations through mutual engagement. And tonight we do so by presenting the status quo of language rights for indigenous and tribal peoples from those regions by experts from the regions whose impressive expertise you may have seen on the flyer already. So there will be very, four, very brief 10 minute country specific presentations by our four speakers followed by an extended Q&A and discussion. And let me briefly introduce my colleagues in speaking order. So representing Australia is Professor Jane Simpson. She's Chair of Indigenous Linguistics and Deputy Director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language based at ANU. The Latin American region is represented by two very dear colleagues and collaborators. Liliana Sanchez, Professor Liliana Sanchez from Rutgers University will talk about Peru and Professor Marcus Meyer from the Federal State University of Rio will present the situation of indigenous languages in Brazil. China, uh, within the Asia Pacific region, is represented by Nora Chuijing Zhong, and I'm sure I have butchered your name, sorry, a PhD scholar at ANU who will present a case study about Uyghur, her own language she is trying to revitalize. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you all for coming, and I hope we have a really engaged and lively discussion. Um, first, like Elizabeth, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and pay our respects to the elders of the Munawal people, past and present. I also want to acknowledge with sadness that I, a non-Indigenous person, am standing here representing to talk about Indigenous language rights in Australia. It's a sad state of affairs that we have no indigenous people in Australia who are speakers of traditional languages who have gone through university to do PhDs. So one of my jobs is to explain a little bit about the background about why that's the case. So before the 1788 invasion, Australia had around 300 languages probably, and perhaps as many as 700 different varieties of those languages. Today, from the 2011 census, you can see that the number of Australian Aboriginal people is pretty small compared with the rest of Australia. So in New South Wales, it's about 172,000 people, 2.5% of the state population. Victoria, still smaller, 0.7%. Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Territory, those in blue, have got some speakers of traditional indigenous languages. And you can see that the Northern Territory is the only state or territory in a state, Australia where we get up to as much as 26% of the population being indigenous. In 2005, my colleague Patrick McConville here was responsible with others for the National Indigenous Languages Survey Report, which interpreted census data, devised an index of language and endangerment, and for a long time has been the main source of Australia-wide information on the status and situation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. 
There has been an update more recently, but uh, it's still quite hard to get accurate figures on where languages are spoken. Today, fewer than 14 of those original 300 or so languages are still spoken by children, and they are mostly spoken in remote areas, particularly in the Northern Territory, as I mentioned. The uh, uh, languages with the most hashes um, are the ones which are the strongest languages. In Australia as well, across Australia, many children now grow up speaking new Indigenous languages which have resulted from the contact of English with traditional languages. These children very often struggle at school because the way that they speak and the way their families speak is very different from standard Australian English. Our colleague here, Denise Angelo, has described them as invisible learners. They come to school, they're not speaking a traditional Australian language, they speak a variety which has some words of English, and the teachers then don't recognise the struggle they are, they are having in understanding standard Australian English. And I'll be very interested to hear from our colleagues as to whether similar situations happen with Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America and in China. In the 2006 census, uh, I've given you here figures of people speaking major indigenous languages, where by major we mean languages of more than a thousand speakers. So you can see we're dealing with tiny numbers of speakers, especially again compared with both China and Latin America. Right down the bottom, you'll see Creole, <coughs> Aboriginal English, Torres Strait Creole, which are some of the names of the new languages. And you can see that the numbers of those are greater than the numbers of the traditional indigenous <coughs> languages, or any of the individual traditional indigenous languages. Um, here you see a, a graph which shows the proportion of speakers of new and traditional languages between 2001 and 2006. And at first glance, you think, oh, 2006, you know, the numbers have gone up. But when you break it down, you see that what's actually happened is that the number of speakers of new languages, varieties of English, have gone up. The number of speakers of traditional languages has actually gone down. So from 46,748, in the 2001 census, that's the aqua block, to 44,952 in the 2006 census. So there is an effect of demography here, that for the last 20 years at least, and probably earlier, a large proportion of the indigenous population have been language learners, that is, they've been children. So the indigenous population in the remote areas has very high numbers of children and um, very few old people because the, um, the birth rate is high and the mortality rate for older people is also high. Life expectancy is considerably lower than that of non-indigenous Australians. At the same time, many indigenous mothers are young. So many of the, people, the children who were five or 10 years old in 1996 are parents of you know, quite old children now. There's a possible break on language shift if the primary caregiver is the grandmother and a language speaker, but because there is so much ill health, there are far fewer of the older generation left to you know, continue giving input to the children in their traditional languages. So if language, if you have a large proportion of young speakers, then if language shift takes hold among them, the spread to the next generation can be very rapid because women are having children quite young. And language shift is usually not to standard Australian English in these remote communities, but rather to Creole or to an Aboriginal English variety, which then makes it hard for young children entering school to understand the language of the classroom, to understand what the teacher is saying to them. 
So this brings us then to education rights. And there are three really fundamental rights that I think we need to consider. The right to an appropriate education, the right for communities to have a say in how their children are educated, and the right to maintain indigenous languages. These three rights, I think, are intertwined. And they were recognised by the Australian Language Policy in 1987 and also by the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So the right to an appropriate education, you know, children who, are not, who do not speak the dominant language are at a great disadvantage in classrooms where they're taught only in the dominant language. So they need access to the dominant language. Good access to the dominant language is probably best given by mother tongue medium instruction to start with and explicit teaching of the dominant language rather than as happens all too often now by immersion in the dominant language without scaffolding via the mother tongue. Whether the mother tongue is a traditional language or one of the new Aboriginal English varieties. And the evidence seems to suggest that um, mother tongue medium instruction programs enhance the d learning of the dominant language and in fact in all curricular areas. The second right is the right for the communities to have a say in how their children are educated. That in, in, when we have communities where you know, the older people may never have gone to school or may only have gone to primary school, it's important that they you know, understand what education can do for people. It leads it then to increased community support for school. If you don't have that community support and community involvement, it's likely to lead to failure in the schools and therefore the children not getting the education that they deserve. <laughs> and if they're not involved, then it's more likely that the children are not going to learn the dominant language and they're not going to learn mainstream subjects. Uh, the final right, the right to maintain indigenous languages, which is protected by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity. But language rights are only as strong as the implementation of relevant policies. But without that explicit protection in law, indigenous communities have got no say and no control over government policies for matters that go to the heart of their children's education and for the maintenance of their languages. So and in, if, if, if those rights are not enshrined, then it's all too easy for an education department to say it's much cheaper to teach in the dominant language, so let's ignore uh, the children's rights to learn in their own language. Um, so, again, as I mentioned, mother tongue medium education programs have been recognised for a long time as an important part of effective strategies to maintain indigenous languages. So they're good for giving access to the dominant language, for having access to a good education, and also for maintaining indigenous languages. But, again, they're only as good as their implementation. So we have a number of problems. We have students who, as I said, don't know enough English to understand classroom English in standard Australian English. For teachers, we have very few Indigenous teachers and even fewer Indigenous teachers who speak an Indigenous language. There's very little professional development for Indigenous teachers to teach in their first languages. Schools very often don't have specialist teachers trained in teaching the dominant language, English. Then it comes to curriculum and assessment. There hasn't been much support for developing rich curricula, making use of the mother tongue, making use of Indigenous languages and very little support for having this at all levels of schooling. The national assessment, our NAPLAN, is in English and it takes very little account of the needs of L2 learners. So they're assessed in standard English and the, you know, their struggles are really not recognised. 
if you have if you have to take a maths test in standard English and you don't speak standard English, you're clearly going to do worse on math, that maths test than children who do understand the instructions rapidly. And finally, we need more materials. There's not all that much engaging material uh, for children. So games, apps, videos, all the kinds of things that they have access to in English. So um, I'll leave it there. I've left you, I've given you an overview and I'm leaving you with our problems. I will be speaking about language policy and language revitalization, especially with respect to indigenous languages in Peru. Um, as many of you know, uh, Peru is a South American country on the Pacific coast, and uh, the structure of my uh, brief presentation will be about some demographic data. I'll talk a little bit about language rights, and then I'll present uh, two um, aspects of language revitalization. One is related to intercultural bilingual education, and their policies and the next aspect will be the activities that the current Ministry of Culture is undertaking for revitalization of indigenous languages in Peru. So this is uh, the map of Peru and as you can see Peru is a multilingual country, it's a multicultural country and as you can see there, uh, uh, and I will go into the detail of it, uh, most of our territory is covered with uh, speakers of indigenous languages. Here you see represented 47 language slash language families because some of the languages I will be speaking of should be more correctly represented as language families such as Quechua which is a language family that is widely known or at least more widely known than the other indigenous languages. Uh, this map was elaborated uh, in coordination between the National Office for Intercultural Bilingual and Rural Education in the Ministry of Education uh, in collaboration with the National Institute of Statistics and in consultation with indigenous organizations and other researchers that databases. And I'll explain the reason for this map in a second. Here you see uh, the 47 languages, indigenous languages spoken in Peru. And in terms of um, number of speakers, you could see that the Quechua family has around uh, higher than 3 million speakers uh, all over Peruvian territory. And it's followed by Aymara, have a million speakers approximately. This is data based on the 2007 census. And uh, followed by other languages uh, such as Shaninka with 97,000 speakers and Awahun with 55. And then the other languages that are above 20,000 uh, speakers, Shawi, Shipibo, Konibo. And at the 10,000th, uh, we have Kukama, Kukamiria, and Matsigenka and One Piece you see that the other languages have very low numbers of speakers compared to these previous ones. And I'm really sad to report that this uh, graph from the Ministry of Education has one speaker of Taushiro, and in, uh, you know, while I was coming here, uh, he passed, well, you know, while I was uh, here, he passed away. So that speaker is no longer with us. So uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that in total around, you know, we have uh, more than 4 million speakers of indigenous languages in a country that has been projected to be around 30 million, have, having a 30 million inhabitants. Uh, this is projected from the 2007 census, which had uh, 27, I'm sorry, 28 million inhabitants. So this means that more than 10% of Peru speaks uh, an indigenous language. So this makes um, language rights a very important issue. Um, uh, for those of us who really care about this. And I'm going to speak about two uh, pieces of legislative, um, uh, of legislation that have become crucial to the development of uh, language revitalization and the respect of language rights. Uh, language, uh, indigenous languages are considered official where they are spoken in the regions where they are spoken by the Constitution of Peru. But two particular laws have uh, made a great impact in uh, language rights in Peru. And the first one is the prior consultation law. The prior consultation law stems from the fact that Peru is signatory of the Con Convention 169 of the International Labor Organization. Uh, this uh, convention states that indigenous peoples have the right to be consulted prior to any administrative or legislative measure that is taken by the state uh, that may affect their collective rights, their physical existence, their cultural identity, their quality of their uh, development, their life and their development. And Brazil is signatory also of this convention. So the state, is, the state is required to consult about plans for regional and national development programs and projects that may affect indigenous rights. Uh, this uh, extends to linguistic diversity, 
And in fact, it requires that where in areas where they are needed, official interpreters registered by the state must be part of the consultation process. So this is stated in the prior consultation law. So this uh, creates the need for official interpreters and official uh, translators. It also requires the creation of an official database of indigenous peoples, therefore the map that I showed you at the beginning, uh, with official self-determined denominations, geographical and cultural relevant information, and a list of representative organizations and an ethno-linguistic map. So these are all efforts that are currently ongoing. The second piece of legislation that is very important uh, to understand uh, language rights in Peru is the language rights law. This was passed in 2011 too. Uh, this law guarantees the uh, individual and collective rights of indigenous speak, uh, peoples to speak their languages, to be served by the state in their language, and uh, to receive bilingual intercultural education in their language and in Spanish, which is the shared language for the whole country. So according to this law, indigenous languages are official languages of Peru in the areas in where they're spoken following the uh, constitution. But as uh, Marcus and I were talking, our countries are very good at laws. <laughs> They're not that good at implementing these laws. So um, in terms of maintenance and revitalization, how does this translate? These are beautiful laws. You listen to me and you're thinking, oh, of course they're enforced. Uh, but this is where I'm going to speak about the challenges of uh, really uh, making uh, these laws into a reality. And I'm going to be speaking about two important aspects. One is intercultural bilingual education, and the other one is language planning. So, um, there are legal basis for intercultural bilingual <coughs> education in addition to the previous laws that I mentioned. Article 19 of the education law states that indigenous people must be, um, education, I'm sorry, must be in agreement with international treaties. There, you know, this is in according to Convention 169, uh, the Constitution and the education law itself. And that the state recognizes and guarantees the rights of indigenous peoples to equality in education with respect to the rest of the nation. So. Uh, this is part of our uh, education law. So this means that um, inter intercultural bilingual education must be uh, um, implemented. And this has been happening since uh, very early on in the 90s. And now we have a national office for intercultural bilingual and rural education. And uh, this uh, section of the Ministry of Education is in charge of the following activities. Uh, curricular development, including language standardization, elaboration of educational materials, teacher preparation and training, and coordination with other units. Crucially, a new unit within the Ministry of Culture. Before, not only did the Ministry of Education had all these roles, but they also had to undertake the role of language planning. But fortunately, the Ministry of Culture was created some years ago so that the Ministry of Culture would have a national office uh, for indigenous languages in charge of language planning. The Ministry of Education also requires for each one of its units to uh, collaborate with the General Assessment Unit. This is the unit that uh, produces these uh, wonderful records of you know, how many students pass the PISA test, how, high rank, you know, how highly ranked is Finland, and how lowly ranked is the rest of the world in terms of taking uh, standardized tests. So uh, this is an uh, internal tension uh, in Peru between respecting indigenous rights and testing as high as possible within South America, which is always uh, not achievable. Um, so in terms of the total number of intercultural bilingual schools, uh, here you see that there is uh, 18, uh, at least higher than 18,000 schools that have been labeled intercultural bilingual schools most of which are at the primary level school. This is for uh, data for 2013. Uh, more than 9,000 schools are primary schools. But you see a drop in secondary schools. So even though the law mandates that it should happen throughout the school uh, you know, um, lifetime, uh, it's mostly focused on primary schools. And there are also some daycare schools. Now, what are the challenges? I'm giving you these numbers and you're thinking each and every one of these schools is an actual intercultural bilingual education school, but that's not the case because one of the main challenges is uh, coverage and monitoring in, uh, within a centralized state. Peru is a highly centralized state, so uh, central authorities have a hard time reaching out to all of the schools in rural areas and indigenous areas and actually monitoring the fact that the school has not labeled itself an intercultural bilingual education 
uh, but it's just a label because some of the teachers require training. And so this creates this one of the challenges. And the other major challenge for a country like Peru is resources for teacher training. Uh, actually making available resources for teaching training. Uh, in terms of language standardization, the first step has been uh, to create alphabets, official alphabets for the uh, majority of uh, uh, indigenous languages. What you see in the, um, uh, in the image above is uh, in the upper part, you see the 21 languages for which uh, there's an official alphabet. Uh, it's divided in uh, only two have an absolute you know, you know, um, consensus and have been officially declared at all levels as official alphabets. Uh, 19 have an intermediate kind of uh, you know, a agreement or, uh, that uh, has been approved by the Ministry of Education. Uh, you see there 10 have reached some consensus between the populations and the Ministry of Education and 16 have no consensus. Uh, with respect to this. And I like to say that even those that are listed as having official alphabets and having consensus, there's indigenous groups within the community that disagree with the alphabet. So this is one of the uh, major issues that uh, we have to deal with. Now, in terms of the other uh, language planning and uh, activities uh, taken up by the Ministry of Culture, uh, the Ministry of Culture has created a sound map of Peru that I hope you can see. I don't want to take too much of, my, of your time. If it doesn't open, I'll just tell you what this is about. This is uh, uh, online, uh, available through uh, web. Uh, and what you can see there in the statistic uh, map is that you have, a, uh, you have the map of Peru with the many languages spoken there. And you can click on them, and you can see, uh, you, know, you can click on the languages. You can hear audio in each one of the languages. You can hear Aymara, Ashwar. And you also have the list of interpreters and translators according to region. And as I will show you in a second, um, was here. There's a list of registered interpreters and translators in a hundred. Uh, there's a list of 173 interpreters and translators in indigenous languages to comply with the prior consultation law that I mentioned before. They are registered, they have been trained by the Ministry of Culture, and they can uh, you know, be accessed. And here you see a picture of uh, Dina Ananko Anawanchi, a Wampi interpreter, uh, that was featured in an article in the BBC News in 2014 as, uh, for her role as interpreter in a trial in the state against the Wampi people due to social unrest in Bawa in 2009. So her role was very important. Um, other projects that the Ministry of Culture is undertaking, promoting uh, the project of actually developing a Peruvian Institute of Indigenous Languages, similar to what Brazil has, uh, and uh, a program called uh, Keeping Voices Alive in connection with a state-run program that's called Pension 65 that is, uh, supports uh, you know, seniors and retired uh, people. And it, this, the, pro the purpose of this project is to work with indigenous elders. Uh, the program Multilingual State which you know has as, has as its main goal the use of indigenous languages uh, for uh, in the public sector. This, of course, has only extended to two regions and in a very uh, minor way: the Cusco region and the San Martin region. So, what are the challenges here? Coverage, resources for state communication, and extending uh, bottom-up approaches because everything I've told you now is from the state uh, downwards, and it, the state has not the strength to cover, to have wide coverage and uh, their challenges. The opportunities, as uh, Jane mentioned, I think we see many because with technological advances, we think that we can support community efforts, access to state services can be made widened through uh, mobile um, phones and uh, also uh, we can provide teacher resources. So uh, some of us are very uh, interested in hearing more about apps, crowdsourcing, mobile access, all the things that can strengthen communities. And with this, I stop. Thank you. So um, well, I'm going to sort of rush through the slides. There's a lot of information here. I believe the slides will be made available, right? For you interested in the details, I'll try to give you an idea 
on the population, territories, languages, the language endangerment situation, documentation projects, bilingual education, the Constitution 1988, which is a beautiful document, modern progressive document, and the current <laughs> threats. We are right now in Brazil undergoing a coup of state, which is trying to reverse much of the advancements that have been reached in the last 20 years at least since the Constitution. So there's nothing else going on in Brazil right now than denouncing and trying to, to get organized in order to prevent the attempts of really occupying indigenous lands and uh, they are almost uh, finishing with the indigenous foundation, the FUNAI, which is responsible for education in some aspects and also health and uh, demarcation of land. All of this is under threat right now in Brazil. So uh, if you compare the indigenous people in Latin America, Brazil uh, is like 0.5% of the population, about 900,000 people. Uh, as uh, if you compare, for example, with uh, Bolivia, which is 62% of the population, even Peru, 24%, it's just 0.5% of the population. However, it's the highest number of uh, indigenous peoples, 305 uh, indigenous people. So, uh, and. Uh, so the, the last census of uh, the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian Geography and Statistics Institute, so we have the Brazilian population 2010 was about almost uh, 200 million, and then indigenous population almost 900,000. Uh, so the distribution about 60% actually live in indigenous lands and 36% in urban areas, 7% in rural areas. And then the ethnic groups uh, varies a bit uh, for the institute, the official statistics of 305 ethnic groups, but uh, other NGOs <coughs> have estimated they are less than that uh, in the 250 indigenous lands. According to languages also, I mean, the official institute says 274, but linguists nowadays are more either uh, between 150 and 180 languages still alive in Brazil. So this is the situation of Brazil in the 1500s when the Portuguese colonizers first arrived. So if you, you see the Carib, Tupi, Arawak, Macro, G languages, about a, a thousand group denomination, probably around 600 languages were spoken in Brazil by 1500 before the colonization. And now if you see what happens, it's a much less colorful map, but we still have 0.5% uh, uh, of the population. Uh, these are the lands. The problem which is being faced right now is that even though it's 0.5% of the population, they get uh, between 12 to 13% of the area of the country. Now, what happens is that if you see like this is the state, one of the largest states in Brazil, the state of Mato Grosso, which is in Portuguese, Mato Grosso means in English, dense forest, thick forest. However, nowadays, Mato Grosso is not so dense in terms of forest anymore. You see the areas which are green, because this is the Xingu area, one of the major reservations. This is also indigenous area, Nabiquara, Sintalar, and other groups. This is all soybean plantations. So this is being devastated uh, very quickly. And uh, the International Labor Organization, Brazil, is a signatory of this treaty. And uh, they recognize that actually uh, the regions of force managed by indigenous people had near zero deforestation. Force outside the protected area had much higher deforestation, 27 more carbon dioxide emissions. So, is another aspect of this struggle that we're going through right now. Uh, also, the, the International Labor Organization report that actually these are key successful policies com com combating climate change in Brazil by preserving these areas. And right now, they are under attack. Agribusiness, uh, miners, loggers, they are all coveting the possession of this 13% of Brazilian territory, which is under the control of uh, indigenous societies. So we have about uh, uh, 1, 160 indigenous languages in Brazil, 
two micro families, the Tupi and Stock, and the Micro J Stock. Micro J is a group of languages which has never been found elsewhere, elsewhere outside Brazil. Forty families, ten isolated languages which have not been classified in any of the major families. Basically, the average is 250 to 270 speakers per language in average. Uh, isolated is still in the south of Amazon area, southwest Amazon area. These are recent pictures, you probably have seen pictures like this in the media, have been spotted, about uh, uh, 20 groups have been confirmed that we don't know which language if it belongs to one of the main families or different types of languages, all under threat right now. Uh, the, the, the State Indigenous Foundation had had cuts of 40% in their budget. The president has just resigned because he is uh, resisting to comply with the, what the, the, the power to be now, the, the, uh, they want them to do. And they're doing it very fast. They change in the legislation very fast. They want to have the control of the demarcated, uh, demarcation of indigenous land for the Congress. And most of the Congress is controlled by agribusiness representatives, and, uh, and they doing things overnight. They change. It. There is a constitutional amendment right now. They're trying to pass it, in which they transfer uh, all. The, I mean, the, the regulations to the Congress. And uh, anyway, so we have, a, this is a demographic distribution. You see about, about uh, only 50% of these languages have over 1,000 speakers, right? Half of the languages have less than 250 speakers. And uh, this is, if you compare this pie, the tiny fraction there is not even the indigenous languages, other languages which are not Portuguese. So very minority. So this is Japanese, which is basically the second language of Brazil. They, the only place in which there are more Japanese speakers outside Brazil is Japan in itself, and the second is Japanese in the south. Then we have uh, other languages such as Polish, Russian, German, Pomeranian, and other languages which came to Brazil and is still sp spoken there. And these are the indigenous languages here, which is about, let's say, 25% of the tiny fraction. Uh, however, they're very diverse. These are uh, several families, the Tupian and the yellow, and then you have, uh, this is the micro G, which are only in Brazil, but also Carib, Arawa, Tucano, Pano, and some isolated languages like Ticuna and others. So very diverse, and of course, they all endangered. 21% of these languages in immediate danger because of sheer small numbers of speakers and low transmission rates. 13 of these languages have, have some complete descriptions. 40% have advanced descriptions. 30% have incipient description, like a master thesis, for example. And about 20% have no scientific description. Some programs, documentation programs, have been uh, happening in Brazil. Uh, some, uh, for example, have projects for all these languages. It's the Product Link project and the uh, project documenting cultural aspects as well, so representing in the map. And uh, bilingual education because of the Constitution, and, uh, which is very modern in 1988. Uh, there was uh, this, or, uh, this agency, SECADIF, which has been extinct in the past few months, and uh, they had uh, implementing specific differentiated bilingual and intercultural programs. So this was very successive, uh, successful. Uh, many people, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, uh, we were organized uh, higher education programs because the dropout rate was very high in the regular programs at the universities in Brazil, throughout Brazil. But uh, so they had specific differentiated programs uh, with the help of academia, NGOs, and the state foundations, and also from grassroots movements, organizations, indigenous organizations. So we had uh, 
this data here. Pedagogical materials, we had a program of pedagogical grammars also, which have been developed with the active participation of indigenous representatives who studied, who went to university, uh, learned some linguistics, and they, they learned about the laws, and now they want the laws to be implemented. So, uh, so tiny, the federal constitution is a beautiful document. You have all those, like in Peru, and probably like here too. <laughs> and that's all recognized. And they, they could, the major turn in 1988, abandon the assimilation perspective. Okay? Indigenous is not a transitional category. And they have the right to remain indigenous. They have their lands, the rights there prior to the creation of the state in itself. That's in the Constitution. And the indigenous studied the Constitution at universities and the university program the past 20 years, since the year 2000. And they now want it to be followed, to be actually implemented. So they're very visible, even though they are just 0.5% of the population was spread in a huge country. They very visible, and they have been able to denounce and make their claims presented in different forums, different places. And uh, we have now this the former president of FUNAI that has been sacked, I mean, land conflicts. That's the situation we're living right now. And uh, you see, maybe you see these images in the media. The, in the Congress in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and uh, <coughs> they are present, they are there, and uh, actually there is a, actually a constitutional amendment that they are trying to get passed right now, and this is the movement trying to help to not to have this passed, because they want to change very fast what has been built after a lot of work that. Uh, in such a scenario. So anyway, we have still a few programs of uh, revitalization, and uh, some programs have had positive impact in collaborative documentation, changing attitude towards land, strengthening bonds between generations, empowering native young researchers, rising of generation native filmmakers, because we have documentation trying to get the uh, members of the indigenous uh, uh, groups to participate actively, coupled with the edu higher learning education programs that we had. So these people, we have a uh, uh, splendid generation, even of f filmmakers getting prizes and everything. And also bilingual education, despite of all the problems, anyway, we had a system of bilingual education functioning. And we are trying also in the kind in the in the in the, the south of Brazil to have a, a, a program, a, a language and S program inspired in the Maori programs. Trying to get this was the strategy by, of all these groups to get alliances to look for uh, people who can actually help them. And now they some people are looking at the Maori people, and the Maori people also would like to. To, to do something uh, beyond what they have done in terms of the language and S program, so there is an agreement now made. And uh, anyway, the, the higher learning programs they were possible because of alliance of the Ministry of Education that created this ProLean program that financed in the past 20 years the uh, education specific higher learning education throughout Brazil. Ford Foundation helped too with scholarships that enabled people to become, uh, to go to the universities at an undergraduate and graduate level. UNESCO has been helping a lot, also in documentation programs and also in the higher learning programs. Lots of universities, virtually all the federal universities in Brazil have been, have now a, a, a higher learning education program in the state they are. Also the grassroots, these are all indigenous organizations which also have been very active and working in tandem and cooperation. And uh, also the museums, the indigenous museum, the state foundation, and the indigenous state foundation. So we have now uh, programs working uh, in all the states in Brazil. Also, we are just organizing these materials on uh, we're trying to have a survey on the language education revitalization program. I have the link here, then you can, this is going to be on 
uh, very soon. And very fast, uh, this Kangang language in each UNESCO, a proposed intercultural dialogue between the Kangang, is um, one of the largest groups of indigenous people in Brazil, the south of Brazil, Sao Paulo, Rio Grande do Sul, Paraná. And uh, uh, the idea is that this project uh, involved the translation and adaptation to the Kangang of some of the principles that have been work, have worked in New Zealand for the revitalization of the Maori language. So we have a Kangang linguist that was through these programs that I've mentioned to you here, and uh, she'll be here for the second semester, she'll be in New Zealand through Massey University, and she's gonna visit the language in uh, uh, in several places, and also the University of Otaki, which prepares the, the teachers for the language in S. And uh, <coughs> so it's the Kaingang, basically. And uh, some pictures here. There was a meeting, and uh, some people, some Maori teachers from New Zealand came. They met with the Kaingang, and uh, they got organized in terms of preparing this language in Est. Uh, there's uh, some, a Maori teacher from the Maori Institute at Massey University and made some activities with Kangan children. And this is a, a, a Mana Tamariki language in Est in Palmerston North, New Zealand. And also the, 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 one of the principles of this has been there too. And now they're gonna, this is the place in the Kangan area where they're gonna be this first language in Est. And uh, this is Marcia, and uh, uh, this is a Maori woman in the Institute, the Maori Institute at Massey University, also in the language Nast. Mari is her name, and this is Marcia Kangai, that's the traditional Hongi. And now this is one of the programs that we are working on. Thank you very much. And today I'm going to talk about the revitalization steps of Maori language with the community in China. Um, I grew up in the community. Uh, I myself is a native speaker of Yugu. So I want just to, uh, through the uh, like small, I mean a, a case study, try to reflect to try to reflect to the whole like other ethnic minority in China. Um, probably you know, like in China, we do have uh, some dialects such as Cantonese. Shanghainese, Hokkien, but you probably don't, probably some of you don't know we actually have lots of different ethnic minority languages. We actually have 56 officially recognized national minorities, <coughs> uh, national, uh, sorry, it's not, not national minorities, plus Han Chinese, like a totally 56 ethnic group in China. And uh, we have the pink region is Mongolian, and uh, the blue region on the uh, top left is the Uyghur people and also Kazakh people and uh, some other ethnic uh, people. And uh, at the red region is Tibetan people. Besides those three big ethnic minority groups, probably you heard about many times, we also have uh, many other ethnic minority groups in China. And uh, if you can see through the, at the bottom of the arrow, which is probably very hard to spot, is like a blue, small blue dot, which are Uyghur people living there. And uh, we also have many, like at least 10 different language families. And the Uyghur people are actually very <coughs> interesting. We have Eastern Uyghur, who is speaking Mongolic language, belong to Mongolic family. And we also have Western Uyghur who speak Turkic language. And, uh, but both think they are like the same Uyghur group. And this is a traditional closing of the like, uh, top photo is uh, my family. Uh, I, you can also spot me here and my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and the, this one, at the bottom is the capital of the Yugo County. I will briefly talk about the history and the language policy and the ecology of uh, uh, Yugo. The ancestors of uh, Yugo, modern Yugo people can be traced back to the Tang Dynasty 
uh, old Uyghur are the same ancestor of uh, Uyghur people and also Uyghur. We got we got a Uyghur person here, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, Uyghur is uh, still remain as a Tibetan Buddhist. And uh, in the past, we are traditionally nomadic tribe, uh, nomadic people, like move around the lands, and then since 1950s. Mandarin has gradually become the dominant language in the Uyghur community, especially since schools and the media use Mandarin as their early language. And in 1982, the Constitution of China states that the people of all nationalities have the freedom to use and develop their own language. However, however it's a bit hard to implement because um, people like uh, pay less attention to ethnic minority languages, and um, also since 1990s, because of rapid economic growth and uh, further urbanization, lots of people move to city or go to city to do work, and uh, less speakers left in the community. Uh, but the good thing is that after mid of uh, 2000. Uh, because of the uh, economic settling down and uh, the community members actually have more co consciousness about to speak and uh, use their own language. The current situation of the language is definitely declined as many other ethnic minority groups in China because lack of child speakers, also lack of uh, young parents to speak the language to children. And another thing is, uh, besides uh, Chinese, learning English also is a compulsory course in China. And also some parents want the, like children, like best for children. They think probably learning Uyghur is uh, useless for their children's future. And in this situation, both Eastern and Western Uyghur are classified as uh, critically endangered. Actually, also like uh, lots, many other languages also in uh, ethnic minority languages also critically endangered in China. Uh, now we'll talk about the revitalization steps. Before talk about, uh, we'll, uh, before talk about the community, I'll start with the uh, government efforts. So, at uh, early 2000, um, the government actually established a four-level protection system for intangible cultural heritage. So from on this list actually is uh, uh, some cultural <coughs> items for Uyghur, for Uyghur uh, culture. Uh, as you can see, we got uh, four different le levels. In, if it's a list in the national level, that means that this kind of uh, items are more important. Actually, governments pay more attention and uh, give more policy support and also funding support. So language, as you can see, is the list in the provincial level and the county level actually also recognized as a cultural item. But they probably just pay less attention to that. So this one, at the left is a Uyghur traditional wedding, people wearing traditional clothing. And at the left, this uh, a lady, old lady, who wearing dark green clothing, also sing, sometimes singing uh, traditional wedding folk songs. And uh, this one is a over offering, which is a type of classic offering for Tibetan Buddhists. Now we'll talk about the school best language maintenance. Uh, actually, those like school best, like school bilingual education, mostly are community initiatives. Some uh, we got some failure cases, especially in nineteen in nineteen eighties and also early two thousand. But we also do have some successful cases. Uh, also, we have a, still have a many problems. I will talk about in a moment. And, uh, but the very good thing is uh, from last year, we eventually, like the local government, eventually agreed to recruit like five Uyghur teachers and uh, they can teach at higher grades and also distant township schools. 
So the main reason for failure of the school-based uh, teaching is uh, because of a lack of teaching resources. <coughs> Only in one kindergarten they established a small uh, booklet for both Western Uyghur and Eastern Uyghur. Otherwise, we don't have any teaching resources and the lack of uh, trained teachers. Actually, many teachers before 2006, they are actually like um, uh, volunteers or like math teachers, PE teachers from school and the school just ask them to teach Uyghur because they can uh, speak Uyghur. And also language as actual curriculum activity, especially if that one is uh, not compulsory one, compulsory attendance and also lack of county government support. Uh, the success reason, obligatory attendance and also parent support for kindergarten in but only in 2009, like some parents actually, and also grandparents come to school every week, like once every week, and try to teach and interpret, interpret with the children. But so they stopped after one semester because they're just getting busy, and also they complain they don't get any pay from that. And uh, one thing I'm going to talk a bit more later is we got a very strong support from a local community academics. Uh, I should mention before, Uyghur are very small, we only have 40,000 people. It's in China, it's regarded as really small ethnic group. We do have a lot, like, uh, not quite a few uh, Uyghur academics working in different uh, university and different fields. So those people, plus some advocates and plus some like school, school principals, try very hard, try to push all this thing happen, try to set the language, teach language in school. So I think in Uyghur situation, it's kind of a different as many other groups. It's not, definitely not like a, Top down, like a uh, top down process, and I also don't think it's a grassroots like process. It's more like from a middle, like from organization. Probably you call this one also as a grassroots, but I don't. I think it's more like uh, those people in the this kind of organization, like school principal or some uh, Uyghur academics, some uh, researchers, and also some uh, advocate, advocates. They, actually try to collaborate together, try very hard to push a lot of things. For example, the, the quota for language teachers, they actually asked for many, many years and eventually got uh, five language teachers, but it's not enough, but it's a good start. And uh, we do have two government-based organizations that uh, focus on like uh, cultural stuff, also involving a little bit in language. And uh, from 2014, uh, the head of a, a high school, who is also a Uyghur speaking person, uh, established Uyghur Education Academy. And uh, they actually is very active. And they doing a workshop for language teachers every year, sometimes even twice a year during the teaching break. And uh, they also, um, it's more like a community best because they're receiving donation from, mostly from charity, also from the community. And another thing I think it's really good is uh, um, that we also have a regional textbook, uh, which actually, what's regional text, uh, textbook is about uh, talking about Uyghur history, culture, custom, and the geography, that kind of thing. But uh, in 2008, we made it as a compulsory subject. And uh, actually, as I noticed, also many, maybe not many, but some other ethnic minority groups in China also have this kind of thing. Though mostly probably like delivery in Chinese rather than early languages, but uh, actually students have raised the awareness of uh, the being a Uyghur, like, like more proud of being a Uyghur as a, like my generation. Yes, if I go back to my community, talk to young generation now, they actually feel very proud. But uh, 
I think like my time, when I go to other city, try to talk in Uyghur, actually feel a bit more shamed, talk in your own language, yeah. And another thing is we also work in online crowdsourcing trilingual dictionary, uh, which is our, I'm uh, involving and uh, try to build with the IT students at NU. Of course, also uh, get great support from uh, Kodo, from the language department in NU. And uh, some further suggestion for like my community. Uh, what we should do is we still want to raise our like awareness of uh, local community people to use their own language because uh, uh, though like after 2000 maybe last f uh, 10 years lots of people have that kind of consciousness but uh, still some people still not too positive like you know, we try to teach in school but go back home parents not teach or grandparents not to try hard to teach so so if possible just through like tv publicity programs and pamphlets and poster on the street and the school say how important is our own language why we should keep our own language why we should learn and teach our own language and we still need government support and funds especially we need some we do have some <coughs> local policy but uh, implement just uh, very hard we need uh, like some more comprehensive policy and also say like uh, help the school to and the community to um, implement the policy and uh, we also need uh, we try to make some language programs but uh, since uh, because in China TV and the radio stations is belong to more like a government run and this thing, so we actually do need uh, like government supports for the language pro programs through so TV and uh, radio stations. And also, we got some language teachers, but they are not uh, experienced language teachers. Uh, so, if you go education academy, academy want to send them to um, teachers, university to ex receive some training. But uh, again, like a lack of funding, we need like government to give some fund to do that. And uh, we, we uh, at the moment we also written curriculum for different levels of students. I'm also involved in that. And uh, again, like online and the mo online dictionary we're working on right now. We also thinking to do mobile app, different mobile app resources because in China, uh, actually more people using smartphones, phones, especially in rural areas than computers. So smartphone apps will be very helpful. Um, and also some other sort like uh, learn from Australia and other community, immersion preschool and the language nest. And also encourage parents to have a bilingual family. Families, that means like, uh, actually we, we're thinking, uh, from a community actually give some, uh, uh, if it's like this language of bilingual families, they can bring up children very successfully, successfully can speak Mandarin and also can speak Uyghur well. We can like give some awards because people always like this kind of thing, awards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, yeah. So this from this case, you might can kind of know the situation in China. But again, uh, it's like basically it's the government have some policy, but uh, not enough support. More it's like a community and organizations effort to revitalize the language. But uh, we got so many different uh, minority languages, and uh, we got a larger one, small one, in different regions. Probably just from region to region, different situation. So you can can you can reflect from this. Uh, uh, case, but uh, you can't just say, oh, whole China ethnic minority groups is like that. Okay, thank you. It seems that uh, Latin America moving from Peru on to Brazil and then moving on to there from uh, to Australia and to China, you seem to have 
a better situation almost in Latin America with higher numbers of speakers, more government support, strong policies that are being implemented so we can actually see the outcomes of implementation. Whereas in Australia and also in the Yugo community, there is more of a need in, uh, for grassroots organizations and community effort. Uh, it was very interesting to see that, Marcos, you have brought uh, Maori people over to Brazil That's and right. then back now you will do this the other way around. This is fantastic. This is a, a great outcome of bringing people from different cultures and different languages together. So may I open the floor to discussion? Any questions please? In Australia we've got two rather different situations. We've got communities where children speak an indigenous language as their first language and we've got communities which are revitalizing their languages. So they need different ways of teaching, whether you're teaching a language as the medium of, through the, as the medium of instruction, or whether you're teaching it as a second language. So across New South Wales, there's new legislation, which is going to make it you know, very easy to teach indigenous languages as a second language <coughs> in schools in New South Wales. The difficulty is there may not be all that much material on those languages. There may be very few trained teachers. In communities in the Northern Territory, the situation is rather different. They used to have mother tongue medium instruction schools, nothing like the 18,000. Uh, in 2008, there were 11, so massive differences and then the government closed those down. So some of the schools struggled on and there are about four in the Northern Territory now that still maintain some kind of mother tongue medium instruction. Part of the difficulty is what Nora alluded to, that parents given a choice, I mean English speaking parents, yeah. given a choice between their child learning Mandarin or Spanish or Yomomata, is probably going to say it's more useful than to learn Chinese or yeah. Spanish. Well, in the yeah. 1980s, well, there was a lot of alliances between more progressive parts of the society, academia, NGOs, and also grassroots movement from the indigenous people that got organized. They had the first uh, NGO indigenous, the New the Nations Indigenous, Indigenous Nation Union, and the uh, I was uh, one important leader at the time, Hilton Krenak and other leaders, they got organized and uh, they pressed the, the they, could, they were able to really, I remember these times, I was working at the Indian Museum at the time, and uh, throughout Brazil there was a lot of movement to recognize the rights, uh, I mean Brazil had signed the, the <laughs> Labor <laughs> International <laughs> Organization that helped a lot to move the, you know, uh, to make the transition law. This is a trans transitory state to be Indian, like the, because before the 1988 constitution, like say, well, you see this kind of discourse in which, oh, you guys have to improve and become part of the Brazilian society because you're not civilized, you're primitive, and this kind of idea was sort of official. And uh, this has been replaced, but. <laughs> Uh, I mean, and this was very important because it gave the basis to the development of higher learning programs, pedagogical grammar, documentation programs, of course, very heterogeneous and different situations, some are better, some are not so good. The idea of intercultural education also was fostered by uh, this basic law, so that was very important. And many people, as I said, many people learned about these laws, about these rights that were stated as, uh, but very uh, <coughs> conservative parts of Brazilian society do not accept that. And uh, now that's a historical moment after 1988 when they trying to actually uh, destroy completely this basis and the practice. So there's a very peculiar moment we're living now. Because they also, they covet the lands. They want 13% uh, of Brazilian territories in the hands of 0.5% of the population. Mm -hmm. So 
Mm -hmm. In Peru, it goes back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. It's not the 80s, it's the 70s. And it's one of the first countries in South America that actually created grammars and vocabularies mm -hmm. for most of the Quechua languages uh, within a general movement for towards agrarian reform mm -hmm. and many other changes uh, about indigenous rights. But, but that those efforts in the 70s uh, you know, became frozen during the 80s. So it's kind of like the history of, of Peru is a little bit different from that of uh, Brazil. So mm -hmm. Peru was a pioneer uh, in South America in the 70s in terms of indigenous language rights, in terms of many of the other, uh, you know, issues of documentation and uh, many um, uh, native speakers of Quechua varieties of languages went to study in the United States. They became linguists. They came back to Peru. Uh, one of them has been one of my professors. Uh, so uh, they, they, this movement uh, started in the 70s, uh, was stopped uh, during the 80s due to many reasons, among them internal conflicts, but also to, uh, you know governments that were less uh, you know in agreement with uh, these efforts and then it went back uh, you know to uh, being uh, revitalized in the 2000s so it's, it's sort of like picking up where the 70s left and you know going back and in this respect uh, the fact that peru is a signatory of convention 169 pushed this beyond the realm of education because in the uh, late 90s and in the early 2000s, this was mostly the responsibility of the Ministry of Education. But uh, the colleagues uh, in the Ministry of Education and the um, you know, unit for bilingual education kept saying, we cannot teach the students, develop curriculum, uh, train the teachers, and do language planning and do standardization because it was a chicken and egg situation. How do you start you know, developing uh, uh, intercultural bilingual education if there are no alphabets? So now the people in the uh, Ministry of Education said, so now we have to do the alphabets. Now we have to create consensus with the people. So finally there was an agreement that uh, if a Ministry of Culture were to be created for that and for many other reasons, then it would be the responsibility of the Ministry of Education to deal with language planning, with language standardization, with everything that has to do with cultural heritage. But that has only happened recently. So the laws were old, but the actual uh, possibility of branching this out so that different government agencies could take care of this is only something from the uh, 2010s. This is only when it's been happening. I think in part it's because education it, so far has been a state responsibility. So uh, it's been very, I mean, the federal government has some power over the states and from time to time it's tried to you know, push them in different directions. But at the moment there is no right enshrined for children to have bilingual education or have mother tongue medium instruction. And I think all we can do is just keep pushing. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very important point because Peru is exactly such a centralized country where centralized, the government decided this is the right, these people have it, we put it into the constitution. And Brazil is more or less yeah. on the way. Yes. So what you are saying, it, this is what is missing, yeah. a comp that the government really understands this is a central issue, not a state issue like in yeah, the but, but also I would like to say, you know, with respect to countries being signatories of Convention 169, mm -hmm. you look at the list and it's mostly Latin American yes. countries. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a huge gap and you see, I think, Norway and another, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Europe country yeah. and uh, everybody else seems to be absent of yes. this. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is not to say that in the world these are the only countries with indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. These are the only countries that have been willing to sign it. Uh, so I was very surprised to see, you know, the list and how short it was and how it only uh, included. Mm -hmm. uh, because by, by uh, if you have national laws, they're important. But if you make commitments to the international right. community, now you, <coughs> you are a signatory of a, of a convention and you have to comply with it. Actually, the program started with the Kain Gang, some Kain Gang uh, uh, leaders and uh, teachers in the village, they were uh, prepared by these high education programs I mentioned, and uh, 
they studied about uh, different programs of because languages are all threatened in Brazil, right? So like in the kind of about 60% still speak the language, 40% do not. Many people worry about that, the old generation worry about that. So they have studied actually uh, the different programs. There's the Green Book of Language and Revitalization by Ken Hale, Jan Hinton, and that was uh, studied, translated, and uh, they said, well, this probably the most effective way of revitalizing a language is working with the children, because children acquire languages so naturally, right? And uh, there are several other methods and one-to-one -one approaches and uh, different, but this one, maybe it could be for this group, the Kangan group, maybe that would be a good idea. So that's, uh, we started some relations. I visited New Zealand in uh, 2015, and now we're gonna take some Kangan uh, teachers and linguists actually to uh, to visit uh, how language and ask is organized. The basic idea is very simple, right? If there is if there is not intergeneration transmission, the adults cannot pass the language down, but the, the grandparents can. So you can you, you you give grandparents jobs, right? Which is good too. And then they come, but of course they not teachers. They don't know how to do so. There is. Uh, the intermediate generation there that can organize structure, activities, games, and uh, several sorts of uh, programs that they can be uh, thought of to be part of the curriculum in the language. And they have been very, I visited some language and asked, Mana Tamarik in Palmerston North, I was really moved, really. It's very emotional to see how that is organized so serious it is, you know. I could speak Portuguese, but I couldn't speak English. <laughs> so they have to stick to, and, and they, they have evaluated this program, the modern itself. So they like that, they, they enjoyed very much the three teachers that came, the two Maori and one is uh, Kiwi, uh, in, in Massey University. And they, they enjoyed come, and they also had a chance to discuss at two universities and also with the Kangan community. Because one thing that happens to the Maori program is that it's very much based on a specialized language and the rights, everything that has a protocol. And uh, so the, the youth, then we received in Brazil, we have the uh, indigenous games, world indigenous games in Brazil. So there was this delegation of Maori that came, the Maori youth that had been through the language and ass. But then they were speaking English among themselves. And we asked them, why don't you, oh yeah, we can so start to speak in Maori. Yeah, well, why are you not speaking Maori? So, right away they shift back into English again. So the, the challenge also they have is that uh, how to make Maori cool, right? So that, I mean, there's so much formal language. They know the rites, they know the prayers, they know uh, the, the chants in the past, but how to make them not Maori cool, how to make people who learned, acquired Maori as kids, right? So it's natural for them. But uh, why should they really speak the language? And how can they continue this? They have a very interesting concept, which is the concept of mana, which has to be, has to do what comes from inside. Why should a minority language really be affirmed nowadays and spoken nowadays? Or we're going to be more and more in a globalized world, right? It became so much homogeneous. It's easier to control. Noam Chomsky says that about 27 corporations are controlling the world nowadays, right? So it's much easier to control people. If you do not have too much difference, you have consumers. So this is what the, the, one of the threats that we are facing right now. It is an urgent threat. It's, not, it's about time for us, if we believe that some of these languages can still survive and cultural difference can still survive, it's the time to do something. If we don't do yeah, something, we're not going to survive. Yeah, yeah, if, if I may, I just briefly want to say, and that's why we, you know, in, in my presentation I said, well, we also want to use this technology that has been done, you know, to attract people to be consumers, but uh, now we want to use it right. for indigenous languages because we want to make it attractive 
for the children. If you have, you, you know, we saw a wonderful example here, you know, during my visit, uh, you know, in, in a workshop where uh, here at ANU they're developing um, uh, video games with uh, that they have uh, indigenous, uh, you know, uh, themes and uh, Aboriginal culture uh, themes. And also, we're thinking with Elizabeth and other colleagues, we've been talking about the possibility of developing apps. Uh, in uh, indigenous languages, so that somehow we circumvent the the, the middle of the situation and go directly, you know, to the twenty, you know, advanced twenty first right. century, mm -hmm. and you know, really? leave behind these other, uh, you know, yeah. uh, preconceptions and prejudices, and just funny enough, this development of technology opens the possibility of doing more bottom up approaches uh, than only the centralized, uh, you know, top down approach. Yes, that's right. But there is one country, to, can I just say something? There, there's one country in Latin America, that's Paraguay, and they have a completely diglossic system. So they have Guaranese succeeded, official, exactly, they have succeeded in having Spanish and Guarani as an official language. Mm -hmm. game. Well, so. not really. I met occasionally with a very important Jesuit yeah. priest. What's his name? Bato, uh, what's his name? Very nice guy, good guy, and uh, I mean, uh, and also I had a chance to visit uh, the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, which is on the border also with Paraguay. There are many Guaranis there, two major people, Guaranis and Terenos. And if you see the situation, the Terena have almost lost their language. They said there was a generation that had decided not to pass the language down because they suffered so much with prejudice. Said, I don't want my children to suffer. So they, they, they can learn Portuguese and forget about this language that causes so much suffering because of prejudice. But the Guarani living in the same, basically in the same environment, but they affirm, because that's the main point. If the indigenous people do not want to keep their language, there's no, nothing that can be done that they want to do. It, it has to come from inside. That's the basic idea of mana, the Maori mana concept. It has to come from the spirit, from inside. If you want to, and basically if you keep this, you keep diversity. And you keep in diversity, you keep the health in the planet, you know? Uh, because if it becomes so homogeneous, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very important threat for the whole planet. I mean, Brazil has been suffering the last few years with drought in the same uh, state such as Sao Paulo. We were on the verge of having no more water in the reservoirs in Sao Paulo. And it's been discovered that uh, when you deforest regions massively, as it has been done in the past two decades in several states neighboring to Sao Paulo, uh, it eliminates the air rivers because of the forest produces a lot of humidity and then this causes the droughts in the south because they destroy these regions. So that if there is not this understanding, we do want to keep diverse, then, I mean, then we're gonna pay a price, a very high price, mm -hmm. as humanity, as mankind, I think. Mm -hmm. I think we should move outside and continue <laughs> the discussion outside with wine and some nibbles. <laughs> I think that would be very good. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you for the <laughs>